Welcome. My name is James Packman and I'm the Rector, the Senior Minister here at Holy Trinity Church in Nailsy and I'm delighted to welcome you to Sunday Catch Up. Sunday Catch Up is where we take the Bible reading and the talk from last Sunday but make it available on the internet to those who might be blessed and encouraged by it and I hope that you are. If you would like to be in contact with us, please do get in contact. The details are on our church website, uh, www.htnailsy.org.uk. Please let us know if you've got any questions or if there's any way in which we can help you at this time. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad you can. May God bless you today. The New Testament reading this evening is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 to 58, and you can find it on page 1157 of the Church Bibles. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear sisters and brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give your, yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. <clears throat> and now a prayer for James and for ourselves. Dear loving and compassionate God, please be with James as he passes on your message for us tonight. Help us to believe the truths that are taught to us now and to consider how they might make an impact in our lives this week. In the name of the child of Bethlehem, our Saviour, Emmanuel. Amen. Thank you very much, Ray. So, good evening, everyone. We are thinking about the end of the world. Some people think the end of the world will come really soon. Other people think it was the end of the world when we lost the football last night. <laughs> I'm not talking about that sort of end of the world. Um, but I have got a big question for you this evening. <clears throat> and that question is... What do you think is most likely to happen first? Jesus will come again, or you will die. Now, I'll tell you the answer, <laughs> because the Bible tells us the answer. The Bible tells us we don't know. Nobody knows whether Jesus is going to come first or whether we will die first. There's no way of knowing. But we do know that one of those will be true for every one of us. That much 
is certain. But the better question is not when it will happen, but better, will we be ready? That is a much more useful question to ask. This Advent, we've been considering the uh, promises of God in the Old Testament that Christ will come. And then the reality in the New Testament that Christ did come. And today, we're considering the promise that Christ will come again. So what does it mean? What does it mean to be ready? Well, for that, best to turn to God's word, which we've done, and we've had read to us some of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This was a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth, and chapter 15 is a long chapter, it's worth a read at some point, but if you want the summary, here we go. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we can have confidence that as Christians, we also will rise to eternal life. There we are. I gave it away. And right at the end of the chapter, Paul gets to some of the nitty-gritty, if you like, which is the bit we just had read. And to help us get our heads around it, I'm going to borrow two words. Two words that Paul uses, because I think they're two words that get to the heart of what he's saying to us. So I think they'll help us. And so the first word, word number one, is change. Change. Okay? Now... You and I have a problem. And it is a big problem. And that problem is we're just not in a fit state to live forever. As amazing as our earthly bodies are, and some of the time they are amazing, aren't they? Um, They're not actually built to last. And, okay, you probably know this. I don't need to convince you. Uh, Our bodies go wrong, don't they? They gradually get weaker. So if we just took this body we've got here now and put it in the new heavens and the new earth, it wouldn't last long. And there wouldn't be much point. God has a better plan. He wants to change you. Let's remind ourselves how Paul puts this. Um, I'm reading from chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. I'm going to start at verse 50. He writes, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I'll tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the imperishable, sorry, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal, and the mortal with immortality. Got there. Twice, you probably noticed, Paul said, we will be changed. This is clearly important. Change is an important word, actually, in God's vocabulary when it comes to us. Okay, change is his plan for us. So, let's just remind ourselves. First, his first desire is that we change from rebelling against him to loving him. That's what happens when we become a Christian. That's change number one. God's second desire is that we change in our character to be more like his son as his spirit works in us if we work with him and cooperate. That's change number two. His third desire is that we are changed through resurrection to be immortal and live with him forever. That is change number three. God has a lot of change planned for you, which is a problem if you don't like change. But it's important, and it's all good change. And the last part of that change will happen after we've died. (coughs) Unless we've been paying attention to what Paul has been saying. Because it could also happen while we're still alive. Because some people will be sleeping in death, 
when this change comes, others won't have died. Either way, the change is going to happen for God's children. So I sometimes get asked about things like burial or cremation and whether they're okay. And people wonder and sometimes worry about these things. The answer is yes, it's fine. We don't need to worry about them. Um, I think sometimes uh, people watch too many zombie films and they think that somehow God is going to get all these bodies out of the grave um, and that's how it's going to work. Well, no, um, that is not how it works. Uh, whether my body uh, is going to rot in the ground or whether it's going to be cremated doesn't matter because my flesh and my blood have got to go. God has made that clear. They're no use to me in the new heavens and the new earth. God will clothe me and you with a new imperishable body. Looking forward to that. So, we will be changed. And this change won't be long and drawn out. It will be in an instant, in a flash. And we will be clothed with a new body that, good news, won't just exist for a hundred years and then wear out, or earlier, but will last forever. Fantastic news. So there we are. We will be changed. Now the second thing Paul is trying to say to us, I think, is, I think, summed up with the word victory. Okay? Victory is our second word. Now, when I say victory, again, try not to think about football. Try not to think about smug French faces or anything like that. Get that out of your head. Uh, because, despite what people say and the rumours, football isn't really a matter of life and death. But what Paul is talking about is. Listen to this. Again, 15, picking up where we left off, verse 54. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. That is an amazing thought. That death will be swallowed up in victory. Just think about that for a moment. It is quite mind-blowing. From that day forward, there will never be another death. Not one. Death will no longer be a part of our experience from then on. It will have been finally defeated. That's strange for us because we're so familiar with death being part of our existence, isn't it? We're used to death having the last laugh. It always gets us in the end. But no, not anymore. And Paul gives us this just brilliant picture of this. Um, he describes death as though it's some kind of wasp or scorpion or something like that, but that has lost its sting. Let me read on. Verse 55. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But, thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I love the picture here. I can relate to it because I don't particularly like wasps. Um, so imagine a wasp that's bothering you. Imagine like maybe in a warmer part of the year, you're having a picnic. Have you ever had one of those picnics where the wasp has basically chased you inside uh, and it's all been disaster? Well, wasps can seriously annoy you, can't they? They can follow you around however much you try and duck or, you know, whether you're a runner or a spotter. Um, they can land on your hair. They can just be horrible. But without its sting, well, a wasp can't harm you, can it? In that case, it's more irritating. It's more like a fly. Mm, just swat it away. Don't worry about getting stung, do you? And it's like that with death. Death is an irritation in life, like a fly. The one thing about death that means it's more than irritating is its sting. Because its sting can, and its sting will, 
harm you unless that sting is taken away. So, Paul, tell us, what is the sting of death? Well, he tells us plainly, doesn't he? It's sin. And that is a problem because we all sin. We just have to read God's law. And the power of sin is in the fact we read God's law and it points the finger at us and we go, yeah, we've sinned. And that means we're all in danger, every one of us. And so the sting is actually a painful reality and it's waiting for us. Or it would be, cue Jesus. Because when Jesus died, we know he took our sin on him, don't we? In other words, he took the sting of death on our behalf. It's like he took that wasp sting or that scorpion sting or whatever it was, he took that sting to save us so that when we meet death, it is harmless. Death is harmless. Now, don't get me wrong, death can be very painful and it can be deeply unpleasant. But through Jesus, it has been robbed of its real sting. So through faith in Jesus, you, me, absolutely anybody can have that victory that Jesus has won for us. Um, I remember uh, a minister I heard years ago, he was speaking actually not long before he himself died, a lovely old guy. Um, and you may have heard me say this before, but I love this. It's, uh, he talked about death. And he said death was more like Clapham than Victoria. Now, in case you're wondering, he was talking about trains into London. Okay, so Victoria Station is a terminus. Okay? All the trains stop there. It's the end of the line at Victoria. But Clapham is a junction. You probably knew that, Clapham Junction. Your journey continues through Clapham to another destination. So, going through death is actually like going through Clapham, if that's not too rude to the people living in Clapham. And the Bible makes it clear that there are two routes, aren't there? There is one where we bear the sting of death ourselves, and there's one where Jesus has taken that sting of death for us. And that is why we want to be on the Jesus train, don't we? And that is why we want other people to join us on the Jesus train, where there is no sting, because of Christ's victory. So, let's go back to our big question. What does it mean to be ready? That was where we started, wasn't it? Well, Paul is writing to a church, okay, like us. And so what he has to say, he says to us. And he says to us from verse 58, the last verse of our reading. He says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. So let me uh, finish by asking, are we standing firm? That's what Paul is asking us as brothers and sisters in a church. Are we standing firm? Are we trusting firmly in Jesus? Are we trusting in the truths that we know that we will be changed? That through Jesus we have the victory? Are we trusting in the promises that God has given us in his word that Jesus will come again? Not move from that truth by something we've read on the internet or by some book that tells us it might happen in a different way? Are we standing firm on what we know to be true? And are we helping each other to stand firm and encouraging one another to stand firm? And, and the second question, is are we serving wholeheartedly? Paul says we should always give ourselves fully 
to the work of the Lord. Now, what does that mean? What, what is the work of the Lord? Is that like just missionary work overseas? Is it serving coffee after church? Or is it, what, what else is it? What is it? What is the work of the Lord? Well, the best answer I can give you is to go back to our purpose as a church because it's based on the best summary I've come across about what it means to live for Jesus. And so giving ourselves fully to the work of the Lord means worshipping our loving and awesome God and giving ourselves fully to that. It means living out our faith in God and giving ourselves fully to that. It means belonging to a caring community where we support one another and giving ourselves fully to that. It means serving others out of love for Jesus and giving ourselves fully to that. And it means sharing the good news of Jesus and his victory, that he's taken the sting of death, so we don't have to. It's sharing that good news and giving ourselves to that fully. If we do that, Paul says, our labour in the Lord is not in vain. Um, We can spend our time doing lots of different things. Sometimes you, like me, you'll have watched a film and at the end of it you'll have thought, well, there's two two hours of my life I will never get back. And you thought, what a waste of time. What will really count when we meet Jesus? Paul tells us, if we give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord, then our efforts will not be in vain. That's encouraging, isn't it? None of it, none of that will be wasted. We might feel some of it is sometimes wasted, but it won't be. None of it. Well, we don't know uh, when Jesus will return, or, for that matter, when we will die. There is plenty of mystery, as Paul helpfully points out in verse 51. Lots of mystery. But some things we do know. We will be changed. We will be changed. And through Jesus, we have the victory. So as we wait, let's, let's stand firm together in this truth as we wait for that day and let's serve together wholeheartedly, giving ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Let's pray for that, shall we? Loving Heavenly Father, we don't really like thinking about death We find it unsettling sometimes. But it is helpful for us that we're not completely in the dark, that you have revealed some of your plans. And thank you that they can bring us comfort because we know what awaits us. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us all be comforted by the words that you've written to us. And I pray that we would comfort one another as we encourage one another with these truths but Lord as well as being comforted by your word we recognise we're also challenged by it we recognise there are challenges there to stand firm and to give ourselves fully to your work Lord you know what that means for us you know where we might be wavering you know where we might be giving ourselves half-heartedly. Lord, please, would you help us in our weakness to know how together we can honour you by standing firm and giving ourselves fully to your work. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.